Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor, and also on your screen right now is Rachel Dance, who is from the Cambridgeshire Deaf Association and will be doing the BSL interpretation for today's webinar. GoToWebinar is the platform that we're using and it allows you to move different aspects of it around. So if you need to see Rachel and benefit from what she's offering, then you can move her to wherever on the screen that you want and you'll be able to keep all of the webcams together and still see the presentation if you need it as well. So uh, I know immediately we've had one question from somebody asking how to see uh, the BSL interpreter. Well, there's Rachel. Thank you ever so much for joining us. I'm really glad that she's been able to facilitate your uh, involvement in this webinar. Now, today's webinar is about change, uncertainty and resilience, and it's the fifth in our Building a Better Chemistry Culture series. Uh, as it will been very difficult to escape your notice. We are, as they say, doomed to live in interesting times. And so this webinar is going to focus on developing resilience to change and uncertainty, which have been brought to the forefront for many in the chemical sciences as a result of the global COVID-19 pandemic. We have three excellent speakers for you today. Uh, Sam Thorogood, who's a mindfulness expert, Boon Tiao, who's an early career chemist, and Rihanna Sinat, who's Vice President of Risk Management at GSK. We're going to be looking at how uncertainty regarding job security and career progression, uh, in, in, including the impact of COVID-19, has uh, affected the chemical sciences. We'll look at change management, particularly from a leadership perspective, and we'll look at the psychology behind facing uncertainty and investigate some coping mechanisms that you can use to try and overcome it. Now, with those mechanisms in mind, please stick around to the very end of the webinar because after we've had some time for your questions, we're then going to have a guided mindfulness, a sort of five minutes guided mindfulness exercise. So not only is Sam going to talk to us about the psychology and the science behind the approaches that he takes, but he will then take us through one of those at the end of the presentations. Really, really worth sticking around for. It'll help to give you that little moment of pause within your day. And it's a skill that you can take away with you and use in the rest of your work life and personal life as well. So our first speaker today will be Sam Thorogood. He works with organisations, governments and schools to help people improve their mental well-being. In particular, he's looking at converting improved awareness into effective behaviour change. He combines proven neuroscience and mindfulness-based techniques into useful daily habits. So Sam uh, doesn't have a camera, but he does have a presentation. So what we're going to do now is uh, hand over control to him so that he will be able to share his presentation and we'll switch on his microphone. So his voice should be the next voice that we hear. Rachel will stay on screen to do the BSL interpretation. I will disappear off into the background, but I'll come back in a few minutes once you've uh, enjoyed the benefits of Sam's presentation. Sam, thank you ever so much for joining us. Ben, thank you very much for organising the session along with Laura, I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone and welcome to the session today, uh, Simple Resilience. So I'm just going to click back on the presentation, some reason GoToWebinar is, uh, I'm just going to shrink it down a bit, there we go, brilliant. So Simple Resilience with myself, Sam Thorogood, normally the sessions I deliver are 50 minutes to one hour long, and so it's very ambitious what we're trying to do today, condense some key messages into 12 minutes, so keep expectations low, but let's give it our best shot. So what I when I first became interested in resilience, I wanted to understand what were the main themes. So researching over 300 resilience studies, what are the main themes that come up again and again? I was surprised to learn there were three main themes, pausing, reframing, and identifying a next step. So we'll link it directly to um, these themes and where I see them, or we all see them in the world around us on a regular basis. But recently I saw it in a news item where a boy, I think he was 12 to 14 years old, been to the beach, very hot day, and he was uh, he suddenly was out of his depth and he was caught in a riptide and he was he wanted to try and swim to the shore, but the tide was just taking him away. And so initially he panicked and then he paused and he remembered what he'd seen on some kind of sea rescue program, which was just to take some slow breaths and then just try and float on the water and use as little energy as possible and go with it. And that allowed him to be then rescued three or four hours later. But we all have a moment in our life where we feel like we're caught in some kind of riptide. So, you know, 
we're going into into life into the water thinking it's just a normal day or a calm day and somehow we're being drawn away from the things that we care about the most the things that we've worked really hard for even though we're trying really hard to get back to the shore and make things okay we're actually getting further away it feels really demoralizing and overwhelming and the three main steps to resilience pausing reframing and next stepping work like this the reason a pause comes first is because we always have a very strong emotional innate reaction sometimes that strong reaction solves the problem sometimes it makes no difference and sometimes it makes things worse so we want to pause that initial very strong emotional reaction to begin to double check is there a more effective option available to us next step is reframing and reframing basically means finding a different perspective you know so i can be one side of the street at my house in cambridge that's one looking at my house that's one frame that's one perspective i can go to the very few hills that we have in cambridge stand on top of one of those hills and look down and i'm looking at the same thing where my house is but my perspective is so different i'm seeing so many different options and then the last step is identifying a next step. Now this often disappoints people because people say, I don't want just a next step, I want a solution, I want everything to be better. Now for thousands of years, it was relatively easy to find solutions because we just needed food, we needed shelter, we, now, we needed water. The way that we live and work now, problems tend to be a lot more long-term and complex. And it's not we're not able to find an immediate solution. Sometimes we can feel paralyzed, we can feel uncertain. So resilience studies are really consistent on this. All we need to do is identify a next step. So once we've paused, we frame, and we've taken that next step, we just repeat that process. Pause, reframe, next step. And you'll see those steps come up in studies as diverse as people rescuing themselves from riptides, bomb disposal experts, and cancer patients. I don't have a camera with me today, so those of you not sure, it's nice to know who you're looking at or who's speaking. That's a picture of me. Uh, taken about a year ago. So we're just going to cover a little bit of neuroscience. Um, so it's, I think it's important for me whenever I'm, I'm trying to understand a new topic, there's a little bit of the science behind it. So we're aiming to simplify some of the neuroscience very simply. If you put your hand now on the back of your head, just above your neck, that's where our chimp brain lives, otherwise known as our reptilian brain. It's five times faster than any other part of our brain, and it's very, very emotionally reactive. If you put your hand now to your forehead, uh, behind your forehead, it's your prefrontal cortex. It's five times slower than the chimp brain, but it's where we become logically responsive. And what resilience really comes down to is our ability um, to uh, calm the chimp brain and engage the logical computer brain. We all have situations in our life where we feel overwhelmed and we feel stressed, and those can create negative thought loops where we're thinking the same thing and we're repeating the same behaviors even though they haven't proven effective over the last two, three or four months, we, we keep repeating them because we're under stress and we're triggering that chimp brain. When we pause for perspective, we're able to engage the logical brain that allows us to break the loop and identify more effective next steps. So the three main elements, pausing, reframing and next stepping, let's sum these up very succinctly. So pause, when we pause, we need something called a restorative break. A restorative break is a moment to disconnect from work and the work environment. It's also a moment to disconnect from distraction. We know there are hundreds of studies identifying the negative impacts of mobile phones. And one of the key ones is that a lot of us reach for our phones when we feel stressed, or overwhelmed, or a difficult thought or emotion. Often it's an unconscious habit. We don't realize we're doing it. And many of us will know now that social media um, creates a feed and that feed is bottomless. So the distraction element is endless. The thing is we are escaping away from what we're feeling, which can feel nice because we're alleviating the stressful emotions, but that doesn't mean we're being able to identify um, solutions or useful next steps. So a restorative break is very simple. Many of you will have them as part of your daily life, but it's key that we, when we do them, we're without our mobile phone. So it could be a walk, could be exercise, could be reading a book, could be cooking, baking, tidying, uh, meditating, mindfulness. You know, you might have one that works for you, it might be lying in the shower, sitting in the bath, whatever it is. The key thing is we have a moment away from everyone else, at least 10 minutes. We're away from other people, we're away from our work, we're away from distraction, and we just acknowledge what's really going on for us. If we don't acknowledge what's really going on for us, then we're not going to be able to identify effective next steps. So pausing, how and when we do it, is crucial or fundamental to strengthening our resilience muscle. And I think that's a really important way to think about resilience. You know. And we know that if we want to strengthen any part of our body, we might go running, we might do strength exercises. Those are incredibly useful and beneficial, but the muscle only grows after the exercise on the rest day. So as much as we might like the idea of the moving is strengthening the muscles, when we move, we're actually breaking and tearing the muscles a little. It's only on the rest days that our body and brain begin to repair and recover. 
is exactly the same for the neural pathways in our minds. So pausing isn't having a guilty rest, it's giving our brain the space it needs to identify useful next steps and create new neural pathways. So reframing, how do we reframe? How do we shift perspective? And I think this image is quite a useful one because if we stood in that dark room and we're looking out, yes, we can see the beautiful uh, sea and the kind of the light outside looks great, but sometimes we know we have those days where we're standing outside looking in and it just looks very dark, it looks very suffocating, it looks very oppressive. So our ability to open different windows and reframe is key to us to begin to help us identify what the useful next steps might be. So we're gonna choose some questions that come up in over 200 resilient studies. Uh, first one, is, is this situation permanent or is there a chance that it might change? And this is the one that comes up most in most resilient studies because the chimp brain, that emotional brain, is only interested in our survival, fight or flight brain, it will say, immediately this is permanent this is wrong it's always going to be like this when we ask ourselves that question is this situation permanent or is there a chance it might change well we might not know how it gets better but we can at least acknowledge there is a chance that it might change it gives us some light at the end of the tunnel instead of being critical of ourselves and critical of our situation we can say Do you know what it's not nice it doesn't feel very good but it's possible that it will change and that opens the door that first kind of ray of light to a useful next step might be possible. Next one, how, how has someone I know solved this problem before? So the chimp brain can make things feel very personal, where they're the only ones struggling and we it's all our fault and you know we're not good people and if only we'd done this differently. But actually if we widen our perspective and say, how has someone I know solved this problem before? It's very, very unlikely that we are the first person to be dealing with the problem that we're dealing with now. You know, hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of humans have dealt with the same or similar problem before and they've found a solution. So we might not even have to create one ourselves. We can imitate what other people have done for us to test out if that might be effective for ourselves. Number three, what's one thing I can do differently today to help me get closer to a solution? So a classic example will be a lot of people when they are stressed or overwhelmed, we repeat the same behaviors every day, hoping somehow there'll be a different outcome. I'm always intrigued doing this and talking about this technique with scientists because in the lab, you know, they would always change variables with an experiment. But when they when it comes to themselves, sometimes they keep repeating the same behaviors, hoping there's going to be a different outcome. Any scientist knows that's a bizarre approach. You know, we've got to say it's about doing things that we can control and, and identifying um, how effective it is. And if it's not working after a week or two weeks, trying something else or trying other approaches which really brings us to the last part, how do we identify a next step? And I think, again, this photo is very important because sometimes when we're looking at whether it's a new career path or we're looking at what will happen because of COVID or the societal implications of COVID or lockdown, it can look like the most intimidating staircase in the world. But actually, the only way we climb that is one step at a time. That's all we need to do. And if we feel that we've got to get to the top immediately, we can experience some kind of paralysis. Well, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do that. And we end up doing nothing. Um, and so it can feel uh, very intimidating, but what we want to do is break that down into an effective next step. So let's think about it, a stressful email from a colleague. So, you know, we've all had those emails from someone. Sometimes we haven't even read the whole email. We've just seen the subject line and the person's name and our chimp brain is saying, this is awful, this is really annoying, this is really frustrating. Well, is this email permanent? Is there a chance that it might change? You know, have I solved a problem like this before when I've got difficult emails? helping us access our logical brain, and be able to identify a useful next step. Let's look at it from another perspective. Let's say we're looking for a job or a grant. The most classic example I hear in, in this area is people saying, I've done 200 CVs. Brilliant, I've done 400 CVs, excellent. But you're still just sending a CV. Oh no, no, I've changed a few lines on the CV. Great, you've changed a few lines on the CV. But there must be different methods. There must be different approaches. And the good news is most people won't change. They won't deviate from those, those kind of repetitive habits. So if we are the ones that do deviate and try things a little bit differently, it's likely we're gonna increase the chance we get a more effective outcome. It's not just about saying this is, there's only one way and I'll keep repeating that way. It's saying there are at least three, four or five ways of identifying a job or a grant and then how we approach that, whether we send a CV, whether we email someone first, whether we ask for a referral, we have a conversation on the phone, 
there are so many we don't obviously don't have time to cover them right now we might we might cover some of them later on but i just want to give you a different perspective and then a self-critical thought you know the chimp brain is very good at saying this is wrong therefore i must be wrong i'm a bad person i'm not good enough self-criticism is very dangerous because not only does it limit our self-confidence we start to see things less accurately both our own abilities and achievements less accurately and the possibilities less accurately so yes, a lot of us feel like we're not good enough or it's it's our fault that things are going wrong. But actually, is it is it permanent? Have I always have I always been in this situation? No, I haven't. What would I recommend to a friend or colleague if they were in this situation? I might say, do you know what? You're having a tough time. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's a very, very difficult environment and situation. No one's really lived in a time like this. It's okay that we're struggling, but there are different actions and responses that we can take. And so there are hundreds, and if we have the time. Some of the groups I work with, I say, right, I'm going to lock us all in a room and we're not allowed out until we find 20 next steps because they are there, but it's creating the space to pause, reframe and next step. And that's absolutely key to strengthen this skill of resilience. So I'll leave you with a very simple quote. First of all, thank you very much for being here. Really appreciate you making the time, especially on such a beautiful day. Or at least it's a beautiful day in Cambridge. You have power over your own mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. And that's by Marcus Aurelius, one of the founding fathers of Stoicism, one of the longest serving Roman emperors. But I want to qualify his quote a little bit because in my experience, it's not easy to manage difficult thoughts and emotions, guilt, shame, anxiety, anger, fear. We all experience those things. It's not easy to manage them, but it is much easier to manage what's going on in ourselves than it is trying to manage all the other conditions and situations in the world. What governments do, what our families do, what society does, what our employer does, what our colleagues do. You know, managing those things I don't think is possible, but it's much easier to manage what's going on within us. And I think from a resilience perspective, what that means ultimately, the, the very succinct point is saying, how do we make a moment to disconnect from everybody, acknowledge what's going on, and then begin that reframing process. And remember, it is a muscle. And like any other muscle, you know, if we don't strengthen it very often, it's going to be quite weak. But if we make the time to strengthen it a little bit day by day, we will become mentally stronger, we will become mentally fitter, and we will become more mentally agile, able to adapt and respond to the challenges or difficulties that we face each day. But anyway, thank you very much for being here, and I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, one thing before we let you go for now, so Sam will be sticking around for the Q&A session at the end and to run that guided mindfulness exercise. But Sam, if people want to know more or perhaps if they would like to invite you into their company to run some of the mindfulness and, and uh, mental health sessions that you do, how should they get in touch? How can they find out more about you? Uh, the simplest way is tiny pause. So if you just put tiny T I M Y pause as in to slow down P A U S E. The reason I spell that out is because some people assume it's kind of dog or cat pause <laughs> if they really like those animals. And they're like, oh, I thought you were an animal charity. No, we're not. So pause as in to slow down, have a Google, send us an email. But I think if possible, what, what, what we'd probably like to do is send some kind of offer to attendees from today. So perhaps um, you or Laura could organize sending that out as a thank you to everyone for attending. Will do. Thank you very much, Sam. Thanks again for, for joining us and for the presentation. Very much looking forward to the guided mindfulness session later on. Thank you. Now, our next speaker is Boon Tiao. Now, Boon uh, doesn't have a presentation. In fact, what we're doing slightly out of uh, out of the ordinary for us uh, is we're going to do this as an actual interview. So I will invite Boone to share her webcam now. And so we should see Boone. And given that it is an interview, you get the treat of seeing yet more of my face as well. So hopefully we'll see both myself and Boone very shortly. And there's Boone. Hi, Boone. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I did an introduction earlier, but let me just run through this again. So Boone, uh, PhD in physical chemistry at the University of Melbourne, postdoctoral positions in Japan, Denmark, and in the UK. Uh, research interests spanning across fields relating to biocolloidal systems with particular expertise in diagnostics and therapeutics. Now, you have had, uh, I think it's fair to say, quite a bumpy ride of things during the COVID pandemic. Um, so please, Boone, tell us your story. Yes, um, thank you, Ben, for the really nice uh, introduction. So I'll tell you my story. So 
as you say, I'm like I'm trained as a physical chemist, and uh, so I did my first uh, postdoc in Japan, and at Tohoku University in Sendai. So that was in 2011, and this so this COVID pandemic sort of reminded me of my time in Japan. So when I arrived in Japan after about two months. Um, if you all remembered, there was this Tohoku March 11 earthquake. So we had the earthquake and the Fukushima radiation as well as a tsunami. So that was actually quite stressful. And uh, but I had a lot of support from my friends and family overseas to you know sort of support me in terms of the psychological uh, aspects of it. Um, but my research was actually quite badly affected because of the you know aftershocks and stuff like that and uh, my lab was actually down for some time as well so that was quite bad but it 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 really reminded me of this time uh, in covid um but then after that i followed someone to Denmark um and had my second postdoc and then followed by England as well. So that was my last postdoc and I decided to come back to Melbourne and I started my lectureship in 2017. So it was all good. I had like um, about five PhD students during this time, during this three years period. Um, and the Faculty of Science promised me a renewal of contract because I was on, um, I was a CI, so Chief Investigator on one of the grants. and. COVID hit and my contract ended right in the middle of COVID pandemic and because of the university budget was being, you know, was quite bad. So they were, unfortunately, they were not able to, you know, renew my contract. But, and it was quite, it was a tough struggle. Like I had to appeal with the union lawyer, uh, the head of school and the research head, they were appealing on my behalf as well. So I had a lot of support from, my seniors and my mentors, but it was just um, it was just difficult to get through. And so, yes, yeah, so I started working as a consultant with a startup. And in a way, it's kind of like my dream to work at a startup company. So it, it just all worked out in the end. And the ironic thing was that the startup is based at Monash, which was where I was working at, but I've moved to chemical engineering department, which was just across the, the the building across chemistry. So I get to go to work as per usual. Um, all the other academics have been advised to stay home to work, but I was allowed to you know go to campus and work in the lab. So it was all good, and I get to still see my students and make sure that they are working. So they all work out in the end for me. So I was very lucky. Fortunate and yeah, so that's kind of a bit of thank my story. You. Well, thank you so much. Uh, clearly, a great deal of uncertainty, uh, mm -hmm. lots of unanswered questions, lots of unpredictable things going on. You, you said you are still able to see your students. You were the CI on that grant. So, what happened to your students? Did, did you manage to get them other places? They clearly have been through the same sort of tumultuous changes that you have. Yes, so definitely. But uh, during my three years at Monash, um, so I've been having joint group meetings with another colleague of mine in the School of Chemistry. So we thought that you know the best, um, the best decision for the students is just to transfer the main supervision role to him because they are quite familiar with his style of supervision and they are quite mm. so my students are good friends with um, his students as well so uh, there wouldn't be too much of a disruption in their personal life or you know in some sort of professional life as well so that all worked out really well and i stepped down as an associate super supervise the role and so I get to see them on Zoom meetings because we're not allowed to have meetings on campus so I see them every week on Zoom so nothing has really changed so it's just once a week where I don't go to work and yes yeah, so I, I see them quite a lot so yeah so that's well, it worked out really well and um, the School of Chemistry promised to have like a 
extra funding for my students as well, just to tie them over in terms of research. So that's great. Yeah. It sounds like you've received plenty of support through this, but it, even with all the support in the world, it's still really stressful. Now, we've just heard from Sam that one really useful way to deal with the changes in your life like this is to go through that that process, the pause, reframe, next step. Um, but yeah, what helped you to face all this uncertainty? Do, do you uh, did you recognize from what Sam was saying that perhaps actually this was something that I did? I didn't put labels on it, but that's how I got through this. Yes, definitely. So, um, so I've been talking a lot to my friends in England and in Singapore, and one of my friends who is quite wise, he suggested extra projection. <laughs> so I traveled to Japan, to Denmark, did karaoke. No, but <laughs> in that's, um, so what Sam said, you know, restorative break is really important. So during the lockdown phase, um, so I was forced into isolation when I came back from Singapore back to Melbourne. So 14 days of isolation and then you know the whole of Victoria Melbourne went into lockdown so that was literally like six weeks initially so I had a lot of time to you know just reflect and I caught up with COVID trends as well I started to do like you know to bake the no need bread that everyone is doing on YouTube and Facebook so I started to bake a lot um, so I brushed up on my baking skills uh, and also I was very lucky to live by the beach so once you know, I was allowed out into the real world. I, I've just been going on a lot of walks, like I walked for, you know, two hours a day in the evening. And, and that really helped a lot in terms of, you know, reflecting. So what Sam touched on is really like, you know, it helped a lot to, you know, just, just, just reflect on it be kind to yourself as well um, and you know appreciate the small things in life like you know silver linings for example so I think it's it, what Sam said about you know um, just cooking or you know picking up a hobby as well it's it's really important so I hope that my baking skills have improved <laughs> but uh, well let's see I can't have friends over yet so yeah, so once this lockdown is over, I'll, I'll bake for my friends and they can watch <laughs> for me. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the university were really good at finding ways to keep your students on, to find research topics for them, to find the right supervisor for them as well. How much difference did it make knowing that you had an institution behind you who were supportive and were helping you with this? Um, I think it's really important to know that, you know, the school and the Faculty of Science, they are supportive of the student and all the postgraduate students, they have been given like the automatic um, extension in their PhD um, studies, so that's really good. And there's a lot of support, financial supports for the students as well, because we I think the university had to cut a lot of uh, budget, so mm. teaching assistants roles have are gone. Uh, we do not need demonstrators in the labs because there are no more labs. So, but there are a lot of financial support from the universities to help you know students who are struggling financially. So it's actually really good to know that you know the universities are doing their best to support the students and their staff as well. So, yeah. yeah. Excellent. One last question as well. Um, what would you recommend? What advice would you have for other people who find themselves in a similar situation, facing uncertainty about their job prospects, about their current contract? What would you recommend to them? Um, I think be kind to yourself and, you know, to be honest, I think things will work out in the end. Um, and if you keep like a pot positive thinking, you'll be able to, you know, look at, you know, the opportunities that are laid out in front of you. So I think that's really important. 
and uh, in terms of you know getting the next job uh, I think it's, it's really important to network and uh, mm. know your colleagues and your seniors in the field as well so for example um, I was sort of like um, part of this society in Australia so it's the Australian Colloids and Interface Science Society. So I was on the board of directors as their newsletter and media communications person. So I do a lot of tweeting and uh, I get to know a lot of you, you know, all the news coming in. So I release the newsletters for them. So I do know that there are a lot of, you know, online conferences going on at the moment. So they are always on the lookout for people to volunteer to you know sort of like chair a session so these are some of the things that you can do to you know put yourself out there to be you know noticed and get to know people so i think networking is important but definitely be kind to yourself exercise go for walks extra projection and all that stuff baking yeah so yeah have a positive, you know thinking as well yeah. So yeah, I think that's the advice that I give myself constantly throughout this, you know, the last few months. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you ever so much, Boone. We really appreciate it. Boone's going to stick around with us for the Q and A se uh, session at the towards the end of today's presentation. A uh, couple of things to point out: if you aren't sure how to ask questions for that Q and A session, the bottom of the Go to Webinar panel uh, there is a, a, a sort of chat box there that will allow you to send in questions to all of our to our uh, panelists for today uh, and to chemistry world in general if there are any questions that you have so do just get any questions in at the bottom there also in terms of that finding a network if you're not sure what networks are around or what networks are available then the Royal Society of Chemistry has a series of local and interest groups so you may find that even though we can't necessarily travel as much as we would like to at the moment and we can't meet up with people as often as we'd like to uh, the RSC is, is a good place to start in terms of finding interest groups in your own particular area of science or related uh, aspects to that. Uh, so do just have a look, rsc.org. Uh, if you're not already a member, all of the details there about how to become a member. I clearly think you should become a member, not least because you get the beautiful, beautiful print copy of Chemistry World, which uh, this one is here. Just it's a little subtle plug for Chemistry World there. That's that's my magazine, and. Uh, to do please consider becoming a member access to those groups clearly can be very important for your general well-being that's that's more than enough for me though our next uh, final guest before we go into q a and then that guided mindfulness exercise is rahana sadat uh, from gsk so uh, once again i'm going to uh, invite rahana to share her webcam uh, but also I'm going to hand control. So Rihanna does have a presentation. So uh, because of the way GoToWebinar works, I think some people there uh, couldn't see the webcams and thought that the presentation had paused. It, it was just that Boone didn't have a presentation for us. It was just a conversation, whereas Rihanna uh, indeed will have a presentation. So I will make sure we pass control over now. Okay. Uh, so Rahana has over, over 22 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. Currently, role her current role within GSK R&D Pharma as the Vice President of Risk Management. She takes pride in delivering with a focus on building capability through high-performance teams. So, in particular, Rahana is going to tell us how to deal with change management, how to look at uncertainty from that management perspective. We've had it from Boone's own perspective as she faced uncertainty during. COVID uh, pandemic. And now, Rahana, thank you ever so much for joining us, for, for giving us uh, that different perspective on what is an issue that affects us all. Absolute pleasure. And I just want to, first of all, confirm that you can see my screen. We can. Looks good to me. Fantastic. Thank you. So first and foremost, thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. Delighted to be here, particularly with a fantastic panel. So really, um, really delighted to join you today. So. Many of us expect to uh, manage some degree of change uh, or chaos in our professional or personal lives, or even from a project perspective. We certainly normally have a plan B to hand, but when we think about our current circumstances, it's quite unprecedented. We have all had to make some changes, be it at home, at work, etc. And it really is 
quite a unique situation in that we've all had to think of our plan Bs. So what I am hoping to do today is give you a perspective of a leadership journey in terms of how to manage that change. What I won't be doing today is sharing any information with re uh, respect to projects, uh, portfolio, um, or our pro progression in, uh, on that front. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so a couple of key factors to call out. So the first thing I'm going to focus in on is communication. And that communication is really both reactive and proactive given the circumstances. So when we think about communication, I think for us, what was really key is having that leadership presence. And um, what I, the reason why I put that in quotes is that typically as a leader, we, you know, we hear about having visible presence, being um, within um, the context of the lab or with your teams to have the corridor conversations. But actually, we've had to be really um, reflective about how we maintain our leadership presence through this circumstance. What's been really important to us here is living our values. So for GSK, our values are, are particularly um, centered around our patient and consumer focus, understanding the impacts on them, making sure that we apply the right mitigation to serve our patient and consumer needs. We also paid attention to the transparency, respect and integrity angle that we need to maintain as well. What's really helped us is that our expectations around courage, accountability, development and teamwork has really come to the forefront of that. I should also point out that when we talk about communications, it's really important to get the routine dynamics right. So we've had to be creative in how we maintain that connection with the team. Um, we've had virtual coffee sessions, We've made sure that when it was appropriate and applicable to use the video format, we've done that. We've, we've taken on board feedback and really paid attention to the individual needs. Next thing um, to be clear around communication is um, setting expectations around governance, escalation, routes and speak up channels. And for me, there's a subtlety here as well in how we communicate. The words that we use. Um, when we are face to face with individuals, our um, verbal tones, our um, presence, our physical presence, our body language can also help in the messaging. When we are solely reliant on communications electronically or uh, and, and not being face to face, we have to be really mindful about the language you use. So a specific example is if you are establishing who needs to be in the in presence in the workforce, and if you start to use a terminology like um, the critical workers, I think you have to be really sensitive to the subliminal messages that you may then portray to others. Our entire workforce is highly valuable and, and absolutely needed to deliver our objectives and goals. So communication and the language we use to set the expectations is really, really key. In the early stages of our leadership journey through this, we made sure that we clarified the expectations around governance and escalation channels so that our staff, our consumers, our patients knew exactly where to speak up, who to speak up to, and how issues would be managed. We were really also very clear on travel upfront. So where things had to stop, um, we, we made sure that that was really clear. And we had to ensure that we were quite humble in our communication channels as well. So I think like many of you, you know, when we, we know that there is a high degree of uncertainty globally in terms of managing the change, what rules were coming up, what actions we were expected to take from a government, a government perspective as well. So we, the humbleness and humility that we had to hold as leaders as well, being very clear up front that here's the things that we know, here's the things that we could possibly change, and we will keep you updated on a regular basis. Transparency and timeliness. So it was 
incredibly important to ensure that we focused on the right priorities and we were, again, humble enough to revisit when required. And within that, we needed to take into account both internal and external factors. So, for example, um, if our plan B for a project relied on a third party, I think we you know, really had to engage with them to understand the ethical considerations of putting more onus on them. What were they trying to manage as well and really have that partnership and collaboration um, worked out very clearly. Um, the other thing I should also work out, um, call out, upon me, is that throughout this, it's really important that we continue to recognize and reward our staff. Um, when we are in a crisis or chaos mode, we tend to go, right, this is our plan. We need to reiterate and keep delivering and keep that focus. But I would, as a leader, always say that take a moment to reflect and pause and ensure that we do reward our staff who are often working at, you know, through a lot of difficulties themselves going through this change. Okay, so I'm going to take you into the area of um, the impact of change. And again, this, this factor is very much um, reactive and proactive. So primarily our focus was on the patient, mitigating and managing the risks, concerns and issues here. We had a fantastic workforce that really thought about the differences in supply chain, um, huge global impact, as you know. So understanding how that supply chain was able to continue to deliver to meet our patient and consumer needs. We also maintain our focus on our people, supporting our employee health and well-being um, goals, and actually being empathetic. So many of you may start your call by saying, please excuse the background noise, or, um, you know, you because you can't control um, the, the, the Wi-Fi or the small kids, etc. So we have to be empathetic in that. We also recognize that there are going to be variances al along those circumstances. And it was really important that we you know, ask questions in a sensitive manner and maintain confidentiality for our staff as well. Um, above all, what that enabled us to do is to make sure that we kept an engaged workforce and was very clear on our goals and deliverables. It is a balancing act for our staff, and I know that. And I think the other thing that I should call out is when we are in the um, office environment, it's very, it's easier to spot the ergonomic changes that are needed, et cetera. So as leaders, you have to go out and ask the questions around safety and health, et cetera, but do it in a, a, in a sensitive manner. So on the infrastructure and facilities, um, the science still needs to continue um, more than ever. Um, and one of the messages that we had to portray is that we had to be really clear on when people needed to be on site, when people needed to be off site. And I, I'm going to use a phrase that might seem a little bit profound, but the science still continues outside of the lab. So we needed to make sure that we were able to convey that in a, in a positive manner. We also took the opportunity to ensure that when staff were working from home, they were clear on their objectives. And you know, we allowed um, our staff to take um, greater time in their development activities and really keep things going. Okay. The last one, I'm keeping an eye on the time in case you think I'm uh, looking on the side here. Um, the last thing is really centered around our proactiveness around business continuity planning and return. So most, uh, most organizations will have business continuity plans that are centered around their critical business processes, our plan Bs, if you will. And most of us would have at some point applied them, but many of us haven't applied them all at once. So this has been a real challenge. And if I put that into context, Typically, when you have a business continuity plan, I am reliant on a partner to get me through my plan B. But if we're all activating into plan B, we really need to reframe our business continuity planning so that whilst we had a firm foundation for um, 
um, applying our BCPs, business continuity plans, we really needed to, to think about any adjustments that we needed to make. It's also been quite interesting in terms of navigating the new. Our organization has continued to um, develop our, both our internal staff, but also keep um, the opportunities open for our external staff as well. So onboarding new staff, virtual learning and development. This has been quite a leadership challenge. Now, it's easier if you are part of an organization coming in into a new role. When you are new to an organization, it can be quite difficult to understand the culture and the dynamics. So as leaders and as teams, we've had to adapt our ways of working to make sure that we get our culture and our values across appropriately. The last point is around planning for success. So here, you know, we, we, we do have a phased return that we're planning to return back to work um, fully. Um, and as we've gone through that, we've not been um, shy of planning, learning, adjusting and replanning again. So we've been re really clear around establishing the signals to enable us to do that healthy phase return and ensure that it is sustainable. So let's try and pull this all together. Um, I could have spent many more minutes on, on, on this topic and I probably missed a, a heap of stuff, but it had, really has been quite a journey for us. Communication was key. Understanding the impact of change has been key. Understanding our business continuity planning and return has been key. And for me, if I had to summarize that for you, the experience has been reinforced by the importance of our values and expectations. I think this was something that the whole organization could come together on. It also re-emphasized re the importance of our innovation, performance, and trust priorities, our leader and staff engagement on our patient, consumer, and people focus. So as I close the discussion today, what I'd like to really call out is the, the many, many staff across our organization and possibly um, our, our, and our partners as well, for maintaining the focus, for ensuring that we continue to manage our license to operate, for not dropping the ball on quality, for keeping safety um, at the forefront of our minds and, and making sure that we deliver to our patients and consumers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rihanna. A really interesting perspectives on that. Very different from Boone, but clearly we're looking at the same problem from uh, from two different directions here. Um, before we get into the, the proper q and I, I have my own question, uh, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, COVID has clearly forced a lot of change in a very short time frame in such a way that uh, it's forced us to do things differently. We, we've had to adapt. Have you learnt anything from being forced to adapt that you will apply the next time you choose to adapt? So next time it's a voluntary change rather than an involuntary change that's been forced upon us. Has there been anything from COVID that's really made you think, well, next time we change structure, next time we write a new strategy, these are the things that, that I've learned? Yeah, I, th I think it's allowed, it's made us think about the um, the agility that we need to have as an organization, both from an organization, from an operations perspective. So how we set up our infrastructure and facilities, for example. Hmm. Um, also from an organization perspective, how the, the partners that we have as well, and being more mindful of their, the, you know, as part of our due diligence, um, there is an, um, an evaluation of partners and their resources, et cetera. But I think it's, for me, it's really leaned on having greater recognition on that as well. Um, I think at the heart of all of this, you know, I keep talking about patients and consumers and that continues to be in our values. I think it's embedded into our DNAs at, the DNA at DSK. But I think none of this is possible without our staff. So, um, it's really reinforced the need to be empathetic to the needs of our staff and in circumstances like this. Well, that leads me to a question that was actually submitted by 
that by one of our, our audience when they first registered. I'm not sure if they're here for the live uh, broadcast, but if you are, then thank you very much for a, a great a great question. Has do you think this? Uh, in fact, I'm going to bring Sam and Boone back in for this as well, in case they have a, a perspective on this. So let me just make sure I've turned everybody's microphones back on. Sam and Boone, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, do you think that in the, it's an awful phrase, but in the post-COVID world, do you think there are it's going to be a different set of skills that are sought after by employers. So, from your perspective as as a leader, do you think it's exposed that actually maybe the the image we had as a leader isn't actually quite right, and then the next generation of leaders who've been through this will have a different set of skills? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to start that off? Go for it. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I th I think that um, if if we think about what we've gone through, I, I'm just reinforce that agility that you need as an individual and to be able to adapt to new circumstances. Um, the courage that you need to sometimes set out, set, um, step up from your comfort bu bubbles of communication styles. And I, you know, and the reason why I'm calling that out is uh, typically as chemists, we have a plethora of uh, different styles. We have lots of introverts and extroverts as well. So I think uh, we have to really take into account um, the different styles and enable the different personality types as well to shine through um, on this. And I think as a leader, um, I would say paying attention to um, the different styles around the table and, and enabling them to be the best version of themselves is really important. Uh Boone, let me just switch your mic on again for a second. Do, do you have any perspective on that? Do you think that we're now looking at, at a different skill set or you yourself are focused on a different skill set because of the challenges we face this year? Uh, yes, definitely. I think um, I have to, yeah, I have to sort of, I think everyone has, you know, Oh, oh Boone has has frozen for me, which may be a connection issue, which is not all that of a surprise. We're relying on the internet and she is literally on the other side of the globe. So uh, we'll just give Boone a chance to come back. Sam, with, with that in mind, if we hopefully still got you, um, clearly you uh, you go to different institutions, uh, helping them to, to deal with their mental health issues and to find ways to cope with that. Have the demands changed given COVID and so on? Are people asking for different things, different training, uh, given the changes that we've seen this year? I think the trend is that people want more support in adapting to change and supporting others to adapt to change. I think that's the, the most consistent shift in trend. But a, a point I'm going to pick up on, I'm not actually going to directly answer your question, I just want to pick up on a slightly <laughs> different point which is that when we think about uh, adjusting to change and when we think about the difference between an average team and an excellent team, what the studies are quite consistent on is it, if we really um, identify one key point, it's about social cohesion, the relationships in that team. And the key element of that is being able to be vulnerable. So that's being able to talk about the difficult things. So what we can see is a trend in lots of teams, especially organizations who are the world's best at what they do, is we project excellence. We project that we're always meant to be in control and capable, and that's not mm -hmm. true of anyone. Everyone has very difficult moments and struggles. So there are two elements to that. One, it's very important that leaders are able to be vulnerable with their teams and talk about the things that they're struggling with or have found, dif uh, that have found difficult. But then also, it's also the responsibility of the team members, even if they're introverts, to be able to talk about some of the things that they might find or difficult or challenging. So I think what I have seen over the last six months is a trend where that vulnerability is more acceptable or in fact yeah. uh, requested more. And that would lead, I would hope, to higher performing teams generally because it's something everyone has had to adjust to together. And there is an acknowledgement that everyone has had very difficult moments, whether it's professionally, personally or a combination. So I guess next time we are we're interviewing for somebody if we're employing them perhaps questions about those sorts of skills are, are the right sort of way to go uh, and actually that leads to a question that we did have from the audience as well um and so clearly we've got boone back on camera let's see if we can uh get boone's microphone back on as well um let's have a look 
So boom, we can't hear you at the moment, but let's hopefully get that resolved. Um, but so the question was, uh, you know, how do we support, uh, in your case, Boone students, Rahana in your case, staff, uh, Sam in your case, workshop attendees, how do you support people to, to open up and share their uncertainties? How do you actually encourage that and create an environment that encourages that? Uh, Boone, just in case we lose you again, let's start with you on that question. In, so sorry, my internet dropped off as I was talking. <laughs> um, yes, so to um, so to get my students to open up to me, um, I, I actually kind of, I don't just engage with them on just the professional level. I sort of like, you know, um, engage, engage with them on an extended level, like a, you know, kind of like a, a standard family. So um, because I've stepped down as an associate supervisor role. So I've told my students that, oh, you can see me as like a big sister. And uh, we, we do sometimes catch up with, you know, WhatsApp chats or stuff like that. That's not talking about work per se. So we do talk about, you know, other interests or hobbies. And um, yeah, so they've been pretty good at that. And uh, yeah, we, we've gotten closer on a personal level. And yeah, they, they've started to share a lot of their, you know, worries and stuff like that with me as well. So I think, yeah, just to, you know, not to have just the professional part, but as well as, you know, as then it to, you know, the other aspects as well. And I think they do see me as like a big sister, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. And, and, so. and Rihanna, Rihanna, what, what do you think encourages an environment where people can speak up? So I think the, the answer is in part of that question. I think as you have to create the right conditions and the right environment, um, and that is stemmed around the culture that you create within your teams. And I think in, to enable those conversations, actually just saying, you know, um, setting, setting the expectations very clearly up front around this is without bias or judgment. And just around sharing of that uncertainty, I, the other thought that came through my mind, Ben, was that it'll come at different levels as well. So there's the, the company goals, the leadership goals, the team goals and the personal goals. And then, in, and, you know, the, the t personal as in team member and then the personal, what does it mean for me? which will be quite layered in there. So you, and I think you really need to strike the balance of what you can ask and who you can rely on to ask as well. So thinking about employee health and well-being as well. So balancing act. We've just got a few minutes left. We've had a question from the audience uh, specifically for you, Boone, based on your experience. Uh, what can a young chemist do to create contingencies in career planning, for example, when there is so much uncertainty. So clearly you said that you'd all, all, always had half a mind to, to become a consultant, to go into consultancy. So you, you may have already started laying the groundwork. What would you recommend that an early career chemist does to, to broaden their horizons? Um, I think, yeah, if, if you're interested in, you know, do, like, you know, getting out of the research labs, and um, there's there's quite a lot of um, sort of like micro credentials uh, training programs that are being advertised. So I think that's a good starting point, as well as, you know, just, just uh, I think for me, my personal experience is because of networking. So mm -hmm. a lot of some of my colleagues know that I've been laid off from Monash and um, they put me in touch with the startup company. And so that's how I ended up in my consultancy role. Um, yeah, so networking is really important. And uh, yeah, and there are a lot of, you know, micro credentials training programs out there that yeah. may want to, you know, start looking into it. So I started to do some myself as well uh, when we were having our first lockdown. So yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Let, one last question, uh, and I'll put this to all three of you. We'll go to Sam first, I think, because uh, we haven't heard from him for the last couple of minutes. Uh, clearly, we're going to learn lots of things from COVID, and at some point, life is going to go back to, I'm doing air quotes, normal. Um, what can we do to make sure that we take 
all of the best bits of learning, the best things we've learned, all the good things from isolation, from social distancing, from all of that, and make that permanent? How can we make sure that we take the good into the future and leave the bad bits behind? I think my my gut reaction to that would be, obviously it's a massive question, but would be to not focus on all of it, just to choose one or two things that we really feel have been beneficial for us or colleagues or family members, and how we can convert that into very, very simple steps. So the behavioural science is pretty consistent. If we want to start doing something on a regular basis, choose the smallest possible step we can, and if it feels easy and we're able to repeat it, it will become a useful habit. But if we try and identify everything that was beneficial in our response to COVID, and I think there's a, there's a key way in terms of how we talk about it, because we talk about COVID like it's this kind of own entity, but actually the key thing is, is a human's response to a situation. So it's, you know, it's how we respond, what we do, uh, trying, to do, trying to respond to all of it or take all the positive learnings forward. I'm not sure that's possible for anyone. I would say cherry pick the two that you think are most useful or valuable for you. Identify a simple way you can do that on a daily basis and just keep doing it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, Rihanna, anything to add on that? How can we make sure that we embed the positive things we've learned over the last six months? So I think first, firstly, um, engage your staff and get the feedback. Um, also engage your collaborators um, and partners to get that feedback. Um, the sentiment I would leave, Ben, is just be open-minded on what the optimal operating model is. I think as we came into this, we all have preconceived uh, uh, perspectives around what works and what doesn't based on legacy ways of working. And this has really forced us into thinking out of the box. So um, be open-minded on the operating model. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, all three of you, for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm, I've got a few resources to share and a couple of thank yous to say, but don't go away because uh, Sam is going to take us through that guided mindfulness uh, exercise just after I've shared a few resources. But for now, thank you ever so much to Rihanna and to Boone. It's been an absolute privilege to have you with us and I hope you've enjoyed it. And thank you for handling all of those questions as well. So uh, I shall close down your cameras and mics now and I'll come back to Sam in just a second after uh, I just point out a few resources that we've made available that are related to uh, today's webinar topic. So uh, on screen now, you should see a couple of links to the Chemist Community Fund. So they do various different events. They're there to help and support uh, chemists uh, across the chemical scientists uh, sciences. So uh, have a look at those links on screen now to see the sorts of things that's coming up and the ways that they can support you. Also career support. Now, this isn't a career series. Uh, we're talking about building better chemistry culture and largely about mental health and people's well-being but obviously your career is a big part of that and the Royal Society of Chemistry does a great deal to try and support people in their career choices and their career pathways so rsc.org slash careers you'll see all of the career support that the RSC offers. These other two links uh, are, are new for us and these are RSC grants that have been extended and expanded given what's been happening in the world recently. So the grants for carers and the assistance grants, they are schemes that help you to cover the cost of different things. They've been extended now to include virtual events, whereas they used to be more for real physical events, but they will help to cover any extra equipment that you might need to work from home or to homeschool uh, for people who are under your care. Um, it might help to cover care that's usually provided by you uh, while you attend an online event, for example. So have a look at those links to see the sorts of grants and supports, financial support that the RSC can offer. And with that in mind as well, uh, you'll see at the bottom or somewhere towards the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel, there's a handouts section. And in that handout section, we, we've put a copy of the Breaking the Barriers report. Uh, now this is a, an extremely uh, telling report that the RSC produced uh, last year, I believe. Um, looking at how academic funding structures are one of the key three barriers or three key barriers to women's progression in the chemical sciences. So do have a look at that report uh, and hopefully that will help you to understand your own position and to get some ideas for the future. The other resources on there are of course always resources that we share related to mental health. The Samaritans are always there if you need to talk, shout likewise if you need to text and uh, if you feel that you're being bullied or harassed then the RSC runs a bullying and harassment 
support line in the just grab that phone number while you can uh, there's always somebody there happy to and willing to listen uh, so in next month's webinar, not technically part of the Building a Better Chemistry Culture series, we're having a one month break uh, because it is Black History Month. So uh, next month, Thursday the 15th of October, uh, between three o'clock and half past, oh, sorry, half past three and half four in the afternoon. Um, we're going to celebrate Black History Month. We'll recognise and celebrate black individuals and their contributions to chemistry. We'll also showcase the importance of, uh, to continue building on their achievements while recognising that firm action is needed to eradicate the barriers of racism and discrimination in chemistry. We're going to look at celebrating the black community, particularly those in the chemical sciences. We'll look at the actions that individuals, organisations and institutions need to do in order to increase black representation and to break down barriers for black people in the chemical sciences and we will uh, have find ways to demonstrate how ensuring a more inclusive community for black chemists is better for all of us so that's uh, that's it for next month you can go to that link right now and register it's open and ready for you to register there rachel i'm very much hoping will be back uh, to uh, help us with the bsl interpretation once again Thank you to the RSC inclusion and diversity team who we've been working with to develop this series. Uh, they find such interesting guests and such interesting people and they know our community very well so they know the issues that you will uh, you will want to hear more about. So uh, Laura Reyes in particular has been invaluable to this series so far and will continue to be for the rest of the series. Um, I'm Ben Vals, the Chemistry World's Digital Editor, but now I'm going to hand back over to Sam, so Sam Thurgood from Tiny Paws, who is going to take us through a guided uh, mindfulness session. Let me just, there we go, we've, we've got control back to Sam at the moment and make sure that we can hear it. Sam, thank you again for this. It's, it's wonderful to be able to end with something so practical, although there's been a lot of learning to take away from today. It'd be really nice to, to have this Tiny Paws at the end. So thanks again, and I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, everyone, for staying on uh, for this session. For some reason, uh, go to webinar, so click back here. So, Ben, can I just check? Can you see the protective pause screen? Just sometimes it. Um... I can see a protective pause screen and an absolutely beautiful photo of a fox. Absolutely, yeah, Me a meditative fox. So, thank you very much uh, for joining. Uh, so, we're just going to look at. We're going to do a very simple five-minute mini mindfulness practice. So, we could define it as mindfulness. We could define it as meditation. We could define it as attention training, which is what the neuroscientists would call it. Uh, but today, instead of having a whole hour on this, we're just going to condense something down to a very short period of time. So let me be very succinct. First of all, the aim of the practice that we're doing isn't to feel any karma. And I know that kind of goes against the current messaging that appears in kind of blogs and uh, gyms and otherwise. Um, it's, it can help us feel a little bit karma, which is obviously very useful. But the main aim is developing our self-awareness. And when we develop our self-awareness, it's easier to acknowledge how we're really feeling, what's really going on, and that allows us to identify more effective responses. So if we're developing our self-awareness, then we know there's value in every single practice. If we're able to feel a little bit calmer or a lot calmer, then that's a bonus. So today I'm going to do two types of practice. Uh, the first practice I'm going to talk about is going to be for those people uh, who are who have their hearing impaired in some shape or form so they can do the practice with their eyes closed and then for the rest of us I will be guiding us so you'll be hearing my voice and I'll be guiding you through the practice but before I get to explain either of those just let me explain our, the aim of what we're doing when we're sitting in silence there and um, is our attention will wander during this practice so the studies estimate that we have anything between 40 to 60,000 thoughts a day so obviously we have a lot of thoughts and our thoughts are constantly drifting either to the past or to the future. Maybe we're worried about something that happened yesterday or two weeks ago, or maybe we're anxious about something that might be happening in the future or something we don't know that's yet to happen. So our attention is already wandering. Um, our ability to return our attention back to the present moment, that's the core skill of any mindfulness meditation or attention training practice. When your attention wanders, and it might wander to five different thoughts during a five minute practice, it might wander 50 times during a five minute practice, it doesn't matter. So each time your attention wanders, whenever you bring it back, even if you only bring it back for five or 10 seconds, you're doing enough because you're strengthening your attention muscle. So it's okay if it wanders, it's very human, our attention wanders, but our ability to return it to the present each time we do that strengthens our attention muscle. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. So first of all, I'm gonna explain the practice uh, for Rachel to convey 
uh, to people who, who are watching her as an interpreter. Uh, so this is what I would ask uh, people to do, Rachel, is um, do 16 breaths, so 16 breaths in total. Uh, the first four breaths are really deep, slow, focused breaths. The second four breaths are very slow, gentle breaths. And then we're repeating that sequence again. So again, the next four deep, slow, focused breaths, and then we're ending with four gentle breaths. So four deep, four gentle, four deep, four gentle, 16 breaths in total. What we're doing in that practice is we're going from what we call closed attention, which is focusing on our breathing in a very specific way. And then we're going to what's called open attention, where we just let our breathing flow naturally. And then we go back to closed and then back to open. And um, so that will allow everyone who's practicing uh, who, who isn't able to hear me to be able to do the practice with their eyes closed. So uh, unless Rachel interrupt, interrupts me, I'll, I'll assume that was clear. And now we'll come to the rest of us. So we're going to do a, a guided practice. So I encourage you now to be uh, sitting down um, or even lying down. You know, if, you, if you've got somewhere you can lie down, please be my guest. We're going to close our eyes. Really important that we close our eyes for this practice. Uh, we're going to put both feet on the floor. Or we're going to just make sure we're sit, sitting in a comfortable way. But um, ideally, legs aren't crossed, sitting down, feeling relaxed, uh, closing our eyes, and beginning by taking four slow, deep, focused breaths. Four breaths in, four breaths out, starting now. After those initial four breaths, just letting your breathing find a natural rhythm. Gently breathing in and gently breathing out. If now is the first time today you've given yourself permission to pause and rest, understand that this is okay. If you notice your attention beginning to wander, Understand that this is also okay. Wherever your attention wanders to is neither good nor bad, it's just a thought. And gently return your attention to focus on your breathing. Not trying to control your breathing in any way, but just letting it find a natural rhythm. Observing how your chest slightly rises as you inhale. And how it gently falls as you exhale. Now bring your attention to all the sounds that you can hear sounds close by and sounds far away. Now bring your attention to your shoulders and your neck, all of the muscles in your shoulders and neck. You might become aware of some aching or tension. Understand that this is okay. And very gently, let all of the muscles in your shoulders and neck become looser. Let your shoulders and neck become heavier. Gently breathing in and gently breathing out. Feeling all of your body just sinking down. Now bring your attention to both of your feet and your toes and your legs. Become aware of your connection to the ground or the chair beneath you 
safe and secure. And very slowly, taking as much time as you need, gently open your eyes. So that was a five minute uh, mini mindfulness practice. There's a lot in that practice, um, but I think before we kind of elaborate a little bit about what we did, let's just acknowledge how we feel, you know, and what we noticed. How did you feel before we did the practice? How do you feel after the practice? You might have become or feel a little bit calm, a bit more relaxed. You might have become aware of a difficult thought or emotion that you've been trying to avoid for the day or weeks or whatever. And that is, you know, very useful information. So anything that we notice during a practice has value. And also to acknowledge when do we actually give ourselves permission to have a moment like that? You know, from the moment we wake up, we're doing, going, planning, thinking, reacting, analyzing. When do we give ourselves permission just to step away from those things, to not take on board any new information and just become aware of what's really going on, to kind of recalibrate ourselves? You know, and that's why it's the cornerstone of strengthening resilience, because if we don't get an effective pause, we don't get effective reframing, and we're not going to see all the possible next steps. So the pause is fundamental. We don't have to do mindfulness. We could do a walk. We could do baking, as Boom, Boom was talking about. So it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's a moment to disconnect. But going back to the practice, uh, three key elements. The first thing we did is become aware of our breathing. When we slow down our breathing, we stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system. It basically means we start to release calming hormones. Those calming hormones begin to reduce the stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, which our chimp brain is very good at releasing, causing something called ambient stress. We don't know when it started, but we know that we feel it. So we're not going to magically feel totally calm, but we can reduce some of those stress hormones. Then we went to sounds. Sounds are an interesting part of the practice, because if I, when I'm asking a live audience, you know, do you like all sounds? People are very emotional and permanently say, of course I don't like all sounds. You know, some noises are just really annoying. Well, what happens if you try and block out an annoying noise, if you try not to hear it? Well, for most of us, it gets louder, feels more oppressive. It's exactly what happens with thoughts. Trying not to think of something is probably one of the most demoralizing things in the world. It's like me saying, please, whatever you do, don't think of a pink elephant right now. You know, our brain can't help itself. So what we're learning about practice is the observing of sounds, which leads to, over, over time, being able to observe our thoughts. Observing our thoughts can feel like quite an abstract concept to some of us, and that's okay. But observing sounds, we all understand that. We can all do that immediately. And then we went to shoulders and neck, and what we're trying to do there is that if you have a difficult thought or emotion and you're trying to get rid of it, like trying to take it out of your head, that can again feel very challenging. So in the first instance, it's much easier to control releasing physical tension. And when we release some physical tension, it's much easier to release mental tension. And many of us will have ways, unconscious ways, that we already do this. You might find yourself kind of rubbing a certain part of your body, like your shoulders or your arm, if you notice some tension there. You might have a shower or bath to help you relax. You might lie or sit in a certain way. All of those things are beneficial. What we're looking to do is trying to optimize those benefits in a very short period of time by imagining um, parts of our body becoming looser. It doesn't have to be the shoulders and neck, it could be any part of our body. But the main thing is um, that we are approaching releasing mental tension by focusing on the physical first. So as you can see, there are three main steps of the practice we did. Um, and I would say to everyone, you don't have to like it all, you don't have to enjoy it all. But if there was an element that felt nice, then you have your own data, you've done your own study. If the breathing felt nice for you, make time to do a bit of breathing. If it was nice to do the listening, make time to do a bit of listening. If it was the shoulders and neck, feeling a bit looser, how can we fit more of those movements or actions into our life? So I'm very grateful to everyone for joining the practice. As we've covered, I'm going to list down the things that we did there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm very grateful to everyone for joining and wishing you, whatever it looks like, uh, one moment for you today. Thank you ever so much, Sam. And thank you to everybody who stuck around for that. I can see from the comments already that people are feeling much more relaxed, that they enjoyed the presentation and uh, that they intend to use this exercise again, uh, hopefully every day to find that one moment of clarity and of pause and reflection throughout the day. So a final huge thank you to Sam Thorogood, to Boon Tiel and to Rihanna Sadat, and of course to Rachel Dance, who's been interpreting through, throughout this entire thing. Quite a challenging webinar 
than us to uh, interpret it into sign language, I think. So f thank you once again, Rachel, for doing such a fantastic job. I'm Ben Fowler, Chemistry World's digital editor, and I hope to see you in the next Chemistry World webinar. Thanks again for joining us.